Hello and welcome to TOTS. I'm your host, Ben Gardner. Today on the show, we have Randy Bresnik. He is a husband, a father, a Marine, and an astronaut. Randy, thanks for joining us. Hey, happy to join you, Ben. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, we were uh, we were talking a second ago about um, how we became connected through uh, through Kurt Lewis, um, and I know he was your roommate in the Citadel. But uh, I, I just kind of wanted to get a perspective. Was he like a neat roommate? Was he kind of like messy? Like, was he the cool guy you like to hang out with, or was he kind of like the guy you'd like to ditch while you were going out and having fun? Or well, the the good news is, you know, for me is that yeah, he's he's one of those good guys, and having been a uh, a Marine before he entered the Citadel, as a you know, he'd gone to boot camp and it, it was a reservist, as enlisted while I was going through college. Um, he you know had stuff pretty squared away, and uh, we had the opportunity to room together not only um, sophomore year but also senior year, so we did it by choice. So obviously, it was a good fit, and uh, we've been lifelong friends ever since. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear. He was uh, just telling me about how he's missed your different launches because he's always like in the wrong place at the wrong time and and just not able to uh, to make it. But spoke very highly of you, so that's that's good to hear. <laughs> well, it's not like he was slacking off with his job, you know, taking care of uh, security for our country and our president. So, you know, he kind of had some important stuff going on. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, he was also telling me um, a bit of your background, just uh, in terms of your family history. Um, and made sure to mention that I should ask you a little bit about this Amelia Earhart connection that your family had. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, pretty as it's been, obviously aviation uh, has been something in, in, uh, in my family uh, for quite a while. My grandfather was a professional photographer, but uh, loved aviation. And when he was uh, very young, you know, early 20s, he became, met and, and became uh, Amelia Earhart's personal photographer. So he, the way he told the story was that, um, you know, she was around very famous person, you know, at that time. And she was, you know, not that enthralled with all the, the big studio names or the big, you know, news um, photographers and people that were doing stuff back then. And here he was just a you know, young guy, great photographer, that, you know, big, big ego. And so for five years, he was a photographer, flying, you know, falling around and, and doing photo shoots. And the way he told it, he uh, he was supposed to be actually be on the plane with her photo document her around the world trip but all uh, you know him and his photographic equipment and all that was traded out for fuel uh which worked out well for me because i wouldn't be here otherwise <laughs> um but he uh, ended up um you know when she her plane disappeared uh he ended up taking all the negatives of all the photographs he had taken to her over the years and put them basically away in his his negative vault um We'll have to take a, another you know break here to exchange you know explain to our, our younger audience what negatives are, but you know that's, that's a whole different story <laughs> altogether. <laughs> but he uh, and and they sat and for fifty years they sat in in his vault out in Southern California, and it was coming up on the fiftieth anniversary of her disappearance. You know the, the year I was Kurt and I were graduating from from college, that uh, he went back in there and pulled them out, reproduced some of the photos. And then the rest of his life, he was out giving talks all over the world, you know, talking about her because he just kind of, you know, put it away and, and out of mind and, and really, you know, it, it was tough for him because he, he felt very close to her. And so it was, was kind of neat to be able, you know, when I came up for my first space flight to go to the, the 99s Museum of, of Women Pilots in, in uh, Kansas, I'm sorry, Oklahoma, and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to space. My grandfather was a photographer. Would you mind if there was something from your collection that I, you know, carried space with? Me? And so I took one of Amelia's scarves, oh, um, wow. uh, STS 129 on Atlantis, and it's a scarf that was in a photograph my grandfather had taken. You know, at that point, you know, 2009. You know, 60 years. I'm sorry, 70 years earlier. And so that was kind of a, a neat tie-in and fly it during the our Atlantis mission and then bring it back and now they've got it in the museum. That's amazing. Wow. And I, I like too, like I think it was such a cool connection between like where aviation has gone and then also your family history and, and the part that you guys have played um, during that. I mean, that's that's an incredible opportunity to be able to take something that your grandfather was photographing, you know, six uh, decades earlier to space and, and to be able to present it in the way is super cool. 
honoring our, you know, those that have gone before us and, you know, keeping things that uh, have happened in our past alive as, you know, uh, not necessarily guideposts, but just, you know, indicators for, you know, things that are possible in the future. For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it harkens back to like some of these, uh, these great quotes, like, you know, if uh, if we don't remember history, we're doomed to repeat it and, and why learning history is so important. And I think, um, you know, your family being tied to to some of the legacies of avi- aviation is is incredible. Um, I was also learning a bit more about uh, your background and about your father, um, who, correct me if I'm wrong, was a pilot in, uh, in Vietnam and then over on uh, the West Coast in L.A. Could was that kind of where your interest in in some of this aviation stuff came from, or did it come from somewhere else? No, we uh, we lived on Twenty uh, Fourth Street, just south of Pico, in Santa Monica, California, and that was under the traffic pattern of Santa Monica Airport. And so, uh, you know, from a young kid, you know, that was really what my, my dad did for a living was he flew, and so I got to you know, have an understanding of his love of flight. You know, I was flying with first flight, uh, we got pictures of it, you know, when I was, you know, a year, year and a half old, and he took my mom, my older sister, and I flying in an old uh, Bell uh, helicopter, and, you know, I promptly fell asleep, according to the family story, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, getting to go fly with him, and, and you know, be amazed at it, and sit there, and, you know, look out the, the window from uh, the hallway or my bedroom upstairs, uh, you know, on 24th Street, and watch the airplanes go around, and see what type they were, and listen to them, it's just something I always found fascinating. And so, you know, he had uh, been a enlisted in the in the Navy, uh, had been a mechanic on an aircraft carrier back in the late 50s. And then when he came home from that, got out for a little while and then uh, wanted to learn to fly and ended up uh, joining the Army Warrant Officer Flight Program. Um, did his first tour over Vietnam in, in 64 and a half, you know, with the first air cab and actually got the first battlefield uh, commission out of the Vietnam War and became a, a second lieutenant and then uh, uh, came back home and then went over for his second tour of Vietnam. Um, after his second tour, he uh, ended up coming home and uh, getting out of the Army and then joined the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and where he spent 25 years doing mountain rescue and patrol, flying fixed wing and rotary wing and, uh, uh, you know, as a flight instructor as well. You know, and even just to, up until a couple of years ago, it was flight instructing out of the flying club out of the San Monica Airport. So all I can say is that I hope that I'm still, you know, in my 80s and still flying because as much as I love it. For sure. Yeah, that's awesome. What made you kind of go from this this interest in aviation and then decide that you wanted to join the Marine Corps? Was Were those decisions like connected? Did you just think that was the best move for you at that time? Um, fortunately, you know, it's one of those that go there, but for the grace of God, go I type of things where here I am, a, you know, a 17 year old kid in, in Southern California going to Santa Monica High School, you know, having these desires to go fly. but. You know, my dad was a, a deputy sheriff. My mom worked as a nurse. We didn't exactly have the, the money for me to go over to Santa Monica Airport and get flying lessons and, and do all that. And so the only way I was going to be able to fly was if I, you know, was, that I knew of was to join the military. And so I'd applied, you know, for everything. And, you know, whether it was, uh, um, you know, Navy nuclear power program, as an enlisted sailor, whether it was the Army War Officer Flight Program like my dad or ROTC scholarships, you know, I just applied for everything and, saw, you know, waited to see what came in. And fortunately, the Marine Corps picked me up for an ROTC scholarship. And so at that point, I, uh, you know, decided that, well, if I'm going to know I'm going to go in the Marine Corps in four years when I graduate, maybe I should do something to prepare for that since I, you know, coming from uh, uh, Southern California, didn't have exactly a, a military background. And so I was looked into all types of universities. Uh, and uh, all over the country, but to include uh, the Citadel and, and VMI as, as state military colleges instead of the, the national academies that we that everybody's familiar with. And, you know, I ended up getting accepted and, and, and made that choice. And it's just very fortunate because the, the Citadel is exactly what I needed at that point. I, I was 17 year old, years old still when I started there. And, you know, the, the funny story is, is that uh, of course, you're on a ROTC scholarship, and so you need to sign the paperwork so that the government uh, can start giving this, the school their money. And so uh, the Citadel's a little different than the average university, and they do have a fourth-class system, you know, just like uh, any of the other uh, military colleges. 
and you get there and, and uh, you know, back then you, you got a haircut right away uh, and you started uh, wearing the uniform and going through the, the fourth class system. And I noticed when I got there that, uh, you know, on the civil uniforms, when you have a contract for the military, you wear a badge on your, your cadet uniform that denotes what service you have a contract with. And so um, I, I noticed early on in, in band, regimental band company there at the Citadel, because I was a percussionist and that was the company I was in, that my company commander, who was the senior, he had this red badge and this Eagle Globe and Anchor on his uniform. And then my platoon sergeant had this red badge with this Eagle Globe and Anchor on it. And, and my, you know, my squad corporal, the, the sophomore, had a red badge with the Eagle Globe and Anchor on it. And my first, you know, 48 hours, those guys were pretty mean and pretty intense. So I was like, <laughs> wow. And so, um, you know, it's like day two, end of the day, they, they walk us over to a different building to be able to then sign our contracts for all of us that had the, the four-year scholarships. So they had folders out there with our names. And I opened the folder up, signed my paperwork, and there's a, a red badge in it. And, you know, i tell you how unaware I was a 17-year-old, you know, high school graduate. I I, th I knew I was on an NROTC scholarship, a Naval ROTC scholarship. I thought, you know, what I knew of that was that I'd open up that folder and see a blue badge because it was an NROTC. I didn't, you know, have the wherewithal that I had <laughs> signed a NROTC Marine Option scholarship. And so, um, you know, I'm under contract, so I put this badge on and I go back to the, the battalion to go back to my room. And, uh, you know, there's things that freshmen do in the barracks, you know, we have to, we have to run and, and all that kind of stuff. So I go running down towards my room and my platoon sergeant, and my squad corporal are walking by and I go running past them. And I think that was the only time freshman year that I heard them, that they were quiet. I mean, it was, it was, I, I you know, can imagine what their faces looked like as they saw this skinny kid from Southern California who's done nothing to earn the red badge, you know, wear one on his uniform when the <laughs> company commander who was the senior had just gone to OCS that summer. You know, the platoon sergeant, the platoon corps had been through boot camp in Paris Island. They had earned their red badge and their, you know, title of Marine. And I had just signed my name to a piece of paperwork. So they did the, their diligence the rest of that freshman year to make sure that I uh, was worthy of, of that badge. And, and uh, I called my mom, um, you know, back in Santa Monica, you know, first chance I got and, you know, explained to her, hey, I got this, you know, Marine option contract. Her first thought was, see if you can get that change in the Navy. Those Marines, they're, you know, it's scary. They, they, they're, they're, you know, going to very dangerous places. Um, fortunately, uh, uh, I stuck, it, stuck with it. And, you know, I, I saw my evolution of the time to the Citadel, all the different services and what they had. and. It turns out that the Marine Corps was, was the perfect fit for me. I would not have been a good fit in another service. And that's a reason why, you know, Kurt Lewis and I got along well and, and were roommates, uh, you know, uh, during two of our years at the Citadel. I love that. That's so cool. And uh, it it's definitely uh, funny that, that you had a very different experience joining the Marine Corps than I think most people had that, uh, that you were interacting with there. Um, what was it like kind of going from that moment like first joining and going through like that first year um like you said they they did their due diligence um what was the hardest part of that year trying to kind of break into um one of the most challenging you know groups in the world um you definitely have a period where it's like you feel like you're unworthy you know and that you see these people who um are out there you know walking the walk and you have to learn how to do it. Fortunately, um, the Marine Corps is good at taking people from outside and turning them into Marines. Um, you know, I never went to, I didn't go to officer candidate school until between my junior and senior year. But by the time I went, you know, after three years at the Citadel and the summer trainings in between, you know, I, I felt very, very well prepared because, you know, the Marine instructors, the, the senior uh, cadets who were, you know, Marines, you know, took an interest in, you know, you be expecting to be one of them and them making sure that you understand, understood the, the traditions, uh, you know, the ceremonies, uh, the history, but also, you know, that you measured up to the esprit de corps, which the Marine Corps holds itself to. For sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So you join, you're a gangly little uh, Southern California kid, and, and you're starting to go through this process and, and build yourself up into a Marine and, and kind of prove your worth there. How did aviation kind of come back into your life from that point? Uh, aviation, you know, it was, it was 
you know, it, all I wanted to do was be a pilot, you know, and that's, that's why I was looking at all the options I could. Um, and, and even, you know, from that freshman year, uh, about a month into the Citadel, I got a call from, from my parents. They said, hey, the Army just called. Your warrant officer flight school, you know, package has been approved. I could have left right then and gone straight to flight school and started flying for the Army. Um, but here I am at the Citadel with a four-year scholarship. You know, I made the decision to stay. Um, it seemed like the right decision at the time, and you know, thank goodness I did. Um, but then it was, you know, you don't, you're not guaranteed anything. And so I, I don't think my junior year, I took the uh, the test, the aviation aptitude battery, where they kind of give that to all the people who are interested in becoming pilots and seeing who's, you know, has the aptitude to do it. Fortunately, I scored well enough to get, get one of those called a pilot slot. And so uh, that meant that once I got commissioned, that I would then uh, go to um, flight school after I got finished with the basic school up in Quantico. And so that's a six month school that every single Marine officer goes to, where you learn all about everything in the Marine Corps from the admin to logistics, to artillery, to infantry and everything. And everybody learns that. And then you go off to your different uh, fields within the Marine Corps. And that's unique amongst all the services because you now the other services, once you get your designator what, or branch or MOS, military occupational specialty, you just go off and do that. And so an Army helicopter pilot, you know, um, has basic Army training, you know, uh, to understand what the infantry guy does or the, the truck driver does, but they don't ever, you know, normally meet on a regular basis with Marine Corps, all the Marine Corps officers are, you know, in the same place. And I had a quick caveat on that was, you know, here I am going to the basic school, going through the officer's course with fellow Marines, going to become a pilot. Years later, when I'm flying in OIF, I, here I am, you know, as a pilot, you know, with uh, weapons on my F-18, I'm talking on the radio, and there are people down on the ground that I had gone to the basic school with, and that I had trained with, and there were infantry officers that uh, you know I had trained with, who that was their MOS, and they were down there in the you know the uh, battalions and the companies that were uh, that were on the ground, and here I am supporting them, knowing exactly you know the training and them themselves as well as the training and everything they had gone through, and that's why you know you'll you'll see that uh, history is replete with stories about why every every person on the ground appreciates uh, Marine Corps close air support over you know anybody else because we know we've trained we, we know exactly what it is that those guys are going on the ground we have that bond and that's why you know we are uh, always do there to do whatever is necessary to make sure that the guys on the ground get the ordinance they need. Yeah, and that's awesome. I th I think it speaks to like why that's such a tight knit group. Why it's like, um, I mean, you always hear too, like people say, oh, like they're a retired marine. It's like, no, no, no. There's no retirement. You're you become a marine. You stay a marine. Um, I think that like whole concept of how tight knit that group is and and kind of that shared experience of getting through something really challenging is something that's kind of rare like these days. I don't know of many ways especially for civilians that you can kind of get into a group where you you have that connection and that bond right off the bat the only thing i can think that's even like close is like those spartan races where you're just you're going through a lot of stuff all at once um but i think it's really important that that exists because when you train hard you can perform in very high pressure situations. Um, and obviously our, our Marine Corps is, is highly trained to be able to do that. Um, and, and we're glad that they're able to do that to protect the country. Um, but I think it's also interesting the connection between um, Marines and, and especially people in the military that then end up going to NASA and, and becoming astronauts. So um, from your time there and, and you know doing your tests and becoming a test pilot to going to NASA and, and starting that astronaut training. Um, was that always a goal of yours or was this something that, you know, somebody had mentioned to you and, and you just kind of started pursuing it or did you kind of fall into it? Um, it was one of those things that uh, I was always fascinated with and, you know, and, and you know, it, almost like, you know, a, a dream type of thing, but it wasn't everything I, I really seriously considered. I mean, I, I had I was building, you know, spaceship models of Apollo and Ed White on his first space with my dad when I was a kid growing up. And, uh, you know, at the Citadel, you know, it was, it was, it was about becoming a pilot. And uh, and I never really thought that, you know, being an astronaut was possible, although I still, you know, followed it, was fascinated by it and, and amazed. 
Um, but then, you know, I go to flight school and I wanted to, you know, fly something that could, that could shoot back. And it's always the needs of the Marine Corps. And so I could have ended up as a helicopter pilot. I could have ended up as a C-130 pilot. Um, it's just whatever the Marine Corps needed. Fortunately, exactly what I was interested in flying, you know, was what I was, you know, did well enough in flight school to be able to get a slot to train in that. And then, you know, my, my, you know, first fleet just ended up being a good fit. You know, I, that was my biggest concern in flight school was that, well, well what if I suck? You know, I, I wanted to do this all my whole life, but what if I suck? And, you know, they got to pull me out of flight school and send me back to go do something, which is why after the basic school, that's why I went to infantry officers course so that if I wasn't going to be a pilot, at least I was going to be, you know, an infantry, you know, platoon commander um, and leader of Marines. But uh, fortunately, aviation was something that, you know, it just, it clicks. It works. It, 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 it's something that I am, you know, uh, as I say naturally have a, you know, aptitude for. And then so throughout my fleet tour, you know, I go from being a brand new nugget pilot to be able to, you know, go to Top Gun and our weapons and tactics instructor course and become the training officer for the squadron by the time I left. You know, responsible for everything that the squadron needs to train to be able to up on, you know, be up on step and be able to deploy and execute uh, whatever it is the nation needs. And so that was just, a dream for me, but it was, okay, well, well, what next comrade? And so, you know, I applied for test pilot school and then, um, you know, so then I'm uh, in test pilot school and, and a Marine that I had you know, been on deployments with, who was in a different squadron had been in a couple of classes ahead of me at test pilot school. And so I finished test pilot school and then I'm working in the, in the uh, strike fighter test squadron with him and he gets selected for NASA. And it was, you know, Doug Hurley, call sign chunks. And so I was like, man, they'll really? take chunks maybe I got a shot, you know, <laughs> but it was one of those things that when I showed up at Patuxent River at the Naval Test Pilot School, I was looking at all the plaques on the wall of all the different classes from class one and this and that and seeing, you know, Alan Shepard and John Glenn and all these people thinking, okay, well, I'm really out of my league, kind of like, you know, the imposter syndrome when I show up at Citadel wearing that red badge. And, you know, to be able to go through test pilot school, which is two years of education crammed into one year with flying, you know, while you're doing it um, and, and surviving that, um, uh, you know, it, it was just a lifelong for now. Now all this experience that I'd has as a fighter pilot operationally, I'm now able to then bring into the new weapons, the new systems, the new software, you know, things to make our, our platforms more effective. And from having learned the engineering side of things at Test Pilot School, be able to then convert my operational knowledge into engineering speak and work with the engineers on designing things and how to make things better. And then ultimately having the responsibilities of project pilots to be able to make the decisions on, hey, this is, this, is this acceptable or not? And so, you know, when the opportunity became available, um, you know, I ended up uh, finishing at Pax River, going out to uh, Marine Air, Air, Aircraft Group 11, um, and then we deployed right away for uh, Operation OIF. And so it was while we were in the desert at Al Jabra Air Base in Kuwait was when they had the call for the next astronaut class. And so I'm filling out my, my application you know, while in the desert um, wow. and, and sent it in. And we came home that May and that August, uh, I ended up uh, coming down for the first uh, set, you know, set of interviews down here in Houston. And so it was just um, every bit of my career had led to that point but, you know, until, you know, I ended up actually getting the call, it, it wasn't something that ever seemed realistic. I mean, even just the fact that I got to be part of 100 people got interviewed for that class, that was, I thought, if, if that's all it is, I'm still honored by the fact that they even considered me, you know, yeah. for this job, um, let alone, you know, end up selecting me the next year. For sure. I mean, that's not many people can can speak to that kind of an experience. And I think to, you know, like growing up and, and having kind of an interest in this, but never really seeing it as a possibility. And then finally getting that call, like that must have been a really incredible moment for you and your family. What was like the biggest reaction out of everybody? Was it shock? Were there people that were like, oh, I saw this coming? Like my my grandma, for example, every time I tell her about something new I'm doing, she's like, I knew you were going to do that has no basis in, in logic or reality, but what were the reactions of, of your family when uh, you first told them that you've been selected to interview for that? 
Well, it, it, it just the little backstory is, is, is it almost ever happened? You know, you, when you get to the point where they're looking at the, you know, the, the finalists, you know, how you interview a hundred, they look at the medical, they look at the interviews they had, the site tests, there's tons of those and, and everything. And they narrow it down to some, you know, 30 or 40, and then you make the final selection from there. Um, at that point, um, typically it's a few months before the, the phone calls. That's when they start calling the people who you put down as references uh, for your, your security clearance. And so you have some idea if they're still looking at you because, you know, your old CEO or somebody might go, hey, they called me for uh, you know, your security clearance. Um, <laughs> so, you you know, well, you know, you're still in the hunt. Right. Well, it was uh, February. It was March. It was April. And I had heard none of that from anybody. And so it, we were coming back from Easter. I was stationed. Uh, my wife and I were stationed down in Miramar. I went to Santa Monica to uh, you know see my dad for Easter and uh, was driving back home. And I was like. Hey, I, th I think the, the dream is over. You know, if they're not looking at my security, you know, clearance by now, then we know that the, the uh, class announcements here coming up in a week or two, um, that, that, you know, I won't be a part of it. And so, you know, it's just, it's like, hey, I got to be, you know, to the point where they were, you know, getting close to doing the selection and I was there and, and, and I, you know, was humbled by that. I said, okay, well, I'm, you know, the operations officer of a, of a fighter squad in the Marine Corps, and I'm going to keep doing that to the best of my ability and, and see where, you know, that takes me uh, as far as, you know, test work on the new Joint Strike Fighter, which turned into the uh, F-35. Oh, wow. And so uh, I'm I'm sitting in my office as the operations officer of a VMF A-232 a couple of weeks later, and I get a phone call. And it is uh, Kent Rominger, the uh, head of the astronaut office. And you'd known that if you get a call from the head of the astronaut office, it's to be that you got the, the, go, the yes for the class. If it was uh, uh, Dwayne uh, Ross, then it meant that you were getting the rejection and thank you for applying, you know, try again another time. So it's Kent Rominger and I'm, I'm stunned. And he says, hey, I've, I've got a job for you in Houston. Are you interested? And wow. like, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm, you know, and, and you should, I, I don't think there's anybody an astronaut that's ever been selected who was more shocked than I was because <laughs> everybody else had had their security stuff. They, they knew they were still in the hunt, and I had had none of that. So I go down to my CO, let him know, and he's like, "Holy smokes, congratulations!" But then he's also knowing that three months later he's got to go to you know, um, go deploy, and, and he's an opso now. Um, and I call my wife, uh, who was working uh, just up the road in uh, Rancho Santa Margarita. And, uh, you know, she had, we had, you know, recently gotten married and she knew that this was a possibility, but we just had that talk a couple weeks prior going, hey, indicator sale, we're saying it's going to happen. So she uh, um, was, uh, you know, very happy and you're, you're crying. She's like, I'm, I'm so happy for you, but I'm so sad for me um, because she loves, you know, she'd gone to UT for her master's degree uh, mm. and loved Austin. Um, but she is not, you know, as much of a fan of Houston at that point. So she's <laughs> not so sad about us having to go to Houston. Um, oh my gosh. And, and to wrap that story up is about two hours after that call from the chief of the astronaut office called, I got a phone call. Hey, this is agent so-and-so from NCIS and I'm calling and I'm sorry, I was supposed to have done this, you know, like two months ago, but I've been behind. I need to do your background <laughs> check for NAS. <laughs> your interview for that i was like information that would have been good to know yesterday right you know? but uh, it all worked out i was you know immensely surprised immensely proud my family you know was was obviously ecstatic and uh and, you know, I, I had never said it to anybody i had never thought it was realistic but later on one of my uh roommates while i was in flight school who happens to be the head of marine corps aviation right now oh, wow. um he said that his wife had told him, you know, when uh, after knowing me for a little while after they got married, she's like, at some point, uh, I think a comrade's going to be either a general or an astronaut. And wow, uh, okay. he shared that with me. The funny part is, is he's now the general and I'm the astronaut. So, you know, she <laughs> was uh, close to both of us. Exactly. She's she's got a high win rate there on uh, on predictions. That's too funny. Yeah. And, and share the sentiment, too, on uh, on Austin. It's beautiful. But, you know. Houston, Houston's got some cool stuff in it too. We don't want to hate on Houston too much. <laughs> yeah. No, we're just, we're not here for the weather. That's all. That's what we say. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Need, need some nice, uh, nice AC for sure. <laughs> but, Wonderful um, place to raise our kids and we love it. And so we, it's been our home now for 18 years. And so we that's very awesome. much appreciate it. It's just, uh, yeah, we, we're not here for the weather. <laughs>
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. And and I wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier. I, I clearly did not do my research well enough, but you mentioned Top Gun School. And I, I knew that you had done some, some uh, test piloting and, and some other things like that, but had no idea that you went to Top Gun School. So could you talk about that a little bit? How did you end up there? What was your experience like there? And then how accurate is this movie that just came out about that whole school? <laughs> um, so I was a uh, junior captain in the Marine Corps. I'd already been to the Marine Corps Weapons and Tactics Instructor Course, which is you know similar to Top Gun, but run by the Marine Corps, where it's not just fighters, but it's our fighters, our attack aircraft, our helicopters, everything, our air defense and everything. Uh, and that's part of what we uh, have as a qualification to become a pilot training officer uh, in, in squadrons. And so my squadron was stationed at the duly minted Marine Corps Air Station Miramar and the Top Gun slump came open. And so the, my squadron decided to send me. And it was actually when Top, you know, right after Marines had moved in, the Top Gun school was still on site at Miramar. Oh, and wow. so I was the, the very last class to go through Top Gun where the majority of it was, was in Miramar. And it was only our final, you know, large force exercise stuff that was actually took place up in Fallon, where the school lives now. And uh, so it was neat because you're there with, you know, Navy and Marine Corps pilots going through the, the syllabus they have, which is just incredibly intense. But it teaches you stuff so well. Uh, you learn all the nuances and you get the opportunity to have um, large force exercise, you know, radars, you know, the whole suite of airborne radars and just working with um you know, fighting other airplanes of uh, different types that uh, you're able to then come back and then take that knowledge. And, you know, the whole point of school is that you come back to your squadron as a training officer and try and recreate as much of that as you can, because we can't send everybody through Top Gun. Right. And so it isn't just to make you a better pilot so that you can become a better instructor to teach other people to become better pilots. Mm, And so one of my, you know, the the best, you know, exercises they had um, that was just so, uh, you know, realistic for what you might see in the real world that, that I thought, you know, that really, you know, just took it to a whole other level was the, uh, the graduation 1v1. And so they get a whole bunch of pilots in the room, all the students, instructors, and all these other guest pilots. And you have the brief, because normally when you go out and do uh, 1v1 air combat maneuvering or beta fight, basic fighter, BFM, basic fighter maneuvers, you have a very you know uh, intense brief because the, while the maneuvers may not be planned, the setups are, are set up. The rules are very much set, and you know you know the person you're going to fight and the type of aircraft they're flying. Well, this you know graduation one v one was all the rules and all the setups, but you didn't know until you actually got to the merge what you were fighting, and you had to visually ID what it was, and then you know make your game plan and your maneuvers based on that split second decision of identification of what that aircraft was. Wow. And so it is one of those things that, you know, you, you're, you're in this, you're in your fighter, you're going to 1v1, which are great and intense, super intense and highly dynamic, you know, uh, to begin with. And now it's, the, it's like what you've been trained for a real world of visually identifying an aircraft if it's a friendly or if it's a hostile. And if it's a hostile, what are they doing after you emerge with them? And what are you going to do to be able to position to, uh, you know, take them out if it's a hostile? And so that graduation 1v1, it could be a, you know, a, a Somebody with a you know a big twenty one. It could be an F sixteen. It could be an F fifteen. It could be you know a P fifty one Mustang. I mean, it it was awesome because you had no idea until you got to the merge what it was, and so was able to go back to my squadron and when we were deployed, be able to set up a you know a graduation one v one, a mini mini version within the squadron, and you know with some uh, other pilots from the other services and other uh, countries, and set that up and do that for my squadron pilots. And, oh, wow. you know, those guys, you know, they, they, they came away with the same feeling I did afterwards going, that was the most intense thing I ever had because, you know, it's like what we talk about, but we never get to really train of, I don't know what's right. going to be there until I see it. I got to make the decision and use all my training to be able to figure out how to, uh, to win that fight in that moment. For sure. Yeah. That's nuts. I mean, I, I can't even imagine like going at speeds in an aircraft and being like, totally comfortable and then also identifying other aircraft <laughs> sounds sounds crazy and, and very intense so that's super cool um so you know the the uh the, you know, the the latest movie what i you know as a test pilot as a <laughs> you know i i was 
I was the second Marine to fly the Super Hornet, you know, way back in the day when it was doing developmental work. Oh, wow. Um, so I, you know, I'd flown that aircraft, you know, as a test pilot, I'd flown the F-14. Uh, as a test pilot, I'd flown the P-51. So I was like a, one of the few people, I think, on the planet who had flown all the airplanes that were in, you know, the, the Top Gun 2 movie. That's um, cool. And what, what I appreciated about it the most was knowing all those airplanes, knowing all the mission, knowing the tactics, being a test pilot like, you know, he was in the movie. It was entertaining. You know, there's yeah. stuff that was not you know, accurate and all that, but it, it didn't matter. They were able to explain it in a way that, you know, in, in as far as understanding entertainment and loving aviation and loving that community, um, I very much enjoyed the movie, took my kids to go see it, uh, you know, and uh, it was just really um, great to see a movie that had, was, a, was a good themed movie that talked about, you know, uh, p- honorable people trying to do the best they can, you know, in situations and dealing with what they with the, uh, you know, the aircraft and the enemy situation and all that they had and just how, you know, um, it is dangerous, but how people are willing to strap on those aircraft and go out there every day and stand the watch, whether it's on an aircraft carrier or at a Marine base or for deployed army base or you know, on a Coast Guard ship, you know, we still have people in this country that are willing to go do that. We, and we still, you know, really owe them a debt of gratitude. It's getting harder and harder these days for young people to want to do that. Um, the, you know, it certainly is, uh, you know, very challenging as the adversaries, you know, uh, capabilities change and improve. And the world's never gonna be uh, a, a, quote, safe place. It, it's right. always gonna be dangerous. There's always gonna be somebody who wants what somebody else has. But the fact that, you know, we are able to be a deterrence uh, and, and hopefully keep it that way um, is something that certainly anybody who serves can be can genuinely proud of. Uh, for their time in service, whether that's, you know, a four year stint uh, or a you know 20 plus year career. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's so important that we have people that are willing to risk their lives in, you know, what I think a normal person and a civilian would say is like kind of a crazy way, like to to strap into an aircraft like that, to learn how it works, to learn combat in the air and, and to be able to provide support to other people defending the country is it's pretty crazy, but it's it's very awesome. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you've gotten to play around with uh, a lot of toys, a lot of different very cool aircraft. Which one is your favorite that you've ever flown? Hmm. That's, a, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, whether, you know, everything from helicopters to big transports to World War II aircraft, you know, tail draggers, the Goodyear blimp, you know, just obviously the spacecraft. Um, you know, having flown the uh, F-14, F-15, F-16, F-18, um, you know, British Tornado, Jaguar, Saab Gripen, um, Mirage 2000 from France, you know, the fighters, the F-18 certainly um, is, is you know, was, was my baby, but it was also the one that had the most agility and mobility and, and just, did everything well, um, so I, I definitely loved it. Um, but as a test pilot, I got the opportunity to fly a lot of warbirds. And you know, to this day, as, as a young kid growing up in Southern California, I watched a show called uh, Baba Black Sheep. And they were flying F4U Corsairs. And then I you know, grew up in you know, uh, an area where the Marine Corps was flying F4 Phantoms. And um, I got a chance, uh, while I was a, a test pilot to be able to fly an F-4, a Phantom, and an F-18. And so everything that was that I'd grown up with, everything that was, you know, the, the preeminent fighters of, of Marine Corps aviation's history, you know, in the last, you know, 80 years, um, I got a chance to fly. Wow. And so when I got to fly the F-4, um, it was actually an F-2G-1D. It was the uh, the Goodyear-built um, Super Corsair. And then the uh, Navy had only built 10 of these at the end of World War II. And they were going to be the super interceptors that were going to be uh, on the carriers to intercept the you know, kamikaze and everything when uh, the U.S. actually was planning for the invasion of the Japanese uh, main island. Um, and so they had 10 of these aircraft that never went into service because we never did the, the invasion. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, you know, had uh, Japan uh, surrender at that point. So these planes in the you know, late 40s and 50s became uh, air racers. 
And so when I got a chance to fly this F2 G1D with a gentleman named Bob Odegaard up in Fargo, North Dakota, it was the only one that existed on the planet. Wow. And so to be able to fly, you know, a plane that, um, you know, there were a handful at the time and only one on the planet flying now, that I'd have to say was, um, you know, the, the most humbling, the, the most uh, unique, the most uh, you know, historically amazing to me as a, as a, as a pilot um, was, the, uh, was the Super Corsair. That's super cool. Yeah, and, and you're you're part of a very small club already being an astronaut, but now you're part of an even more exclusive club of people who have been able to fly that plane. So that's, uh, that's super cool. That's awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about space. You've been to space several times and, and you've spent a lot of time there as well. What was it like your first time going to space and, and just kind of experiencing something that had basically been building your entire life? Um, you know, you get to, uh, you get to NASA and you, and you get into ask can training, astronaut candidate training, and that gives you the basic skills in a bunch of different areas so that you could then go into specific flight assignment training. So we're, you know, learning to fly the robotic arm. We're doing training to do spacewalks underwater in the world's largest swimming pool called the neutral buoyancy lab. Um, we're learning orbital dynamics, we're learning the systems of the space station and the space shuttle, um, as, as ask cans. And then when you graduate, you start uh, doing uh, technical work within the office until you wait for your, your flight assignment. Well, um, it turns out that uh, while we're waiting for a flight assignment, um, you know, we, we grew our family. And part of that ended up being uh, after uh, um, I got assigned to the space flight, my wife became pregnant. And so uh, it turns out that uh, while the course of the, the training, um, that uh, the launch date and the launch date ended up uh, coinciding. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> host of, uh, of errors. I was supposed to be home for the birth of our, our, our daughter, and but then the, the, something happened with the vehicle and then the launch windows, and then Doc said, hey, we need to induce, induce early. So when I launched, um, my wife was nine months pregnant, about two and a half miles away, and we knew that if the, the solid rocket, rocket motors lit, because there, there was no coming back after those things light, that I wasn't going to be there for the, for the birth, birth of our daughter. And so, you know, a lot of people are, well, are you scared, you know, um, you know, you're sitting on this big, huge, you know, six and a half million pounds of, you know, rocket thrust. And, you know, what do you, what's going through your head was, you know, for me, it was, I wasn't worried about the vehicle or, you know, we had, our crew was super trained. Um, you know, everybody, you know, on our vehicle with its, you know, three or 4 million parts all working together perfectly had done their best. So I wasn't worried about the vehicle. And I, I was more concerned that, you know, my wife, you know, was, was right. going to be okay. Uh, you, you know, saw those solid rocket motors launch. And, uh, you know, people, were you scared? People will ask. And I'm like, well, no, nobody was shooting at me. So, I mean, this, everything just has to work, you know, the way we it. Um, and so, um, you know, you spend eight and a half minutes going uphill on a rocket where in a simulator, you know, eight, we had simulators that actually tilted you on your back and then came up into the upright as you entered, you know, got to the rest of the ascent. And so you knew what it bounced like. It had audio in there, so you knew what it sounded like. All the switches and everything were in the configuration. The simulator ran it like it was supposed to be like. But to feel the acceleration where, you know, I think sure you've been in, you know, a fast car where someone will just stomp on the gas and you push back into your seat and you have that kind of wee feeling or, or a roller coaster where you get shot out. Um, and uh, but all those things that you've ever been in, a plane taking off, you know, for example, where the thrust is up at full power, you get airborne, but then they pull a throttle back and you don't feel pushed into your seat as much anymore. Acceleration tapers off because the power of those engines only has, you know, so much um you know, translation until the drag of the air and slows the car or the airplane down enough that uh, you can't keep accelerating. So to have acceleration push back in your seat, you're like, okay, that's, you know, it's, it's less than three Gs. You know, it, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, just like flying. But then after a minute two, you go, wait, we're still accelerating. I'm still back in my seat <laughs> and we're still accelerating. That's when you, your brain just goes, I've never been anything that had this much power that it can just keep accelerating. And then the solids come off in about two and a half minutes. And then that center line tank, external tank is being drained out of the three shuttle main engines at the rate of an Olympic swimming pool every second. Oh and so it's gosh. getting lighter. 
So the thrust, you know, a million and a half pounds of thrust out the back end is the same, but the tank's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So you're continuing to accelerate it. So we actually, you know, come uphill, we roll to get aligned with the inclination of the space station. And then about Mach 13, we roll upright. So the antennas can then start talking to the satellites. At that point, you're about Mach 13, and then you're just almost kind of level, and you're going from Mach 13 to Mach 25 in just a couple of minutes because wow. everything's getting lighter while it's still putting out the same amount of thrust. And so you're you're watching all that, the, the displays and everything's, you know, it was a pretty nominal launch for us. So it's going as planned, you know, and then all of a sudden, made any cutoff happens, and all of a sudden, poof, everything floats. You're being held into your seat by your straps, but everything's floating. And I go, okay, that did not happen in the simulator. <laughs> it's a little and, different this time. And, a little different. And so I really, you know, um, had my aha moment for space when as soon as we, you know, got to main engine cutoff, I'm sitting in the, the MS2 or the flight engineer seat over to my right was Leland Melvin in the MS1 seat. And Mike Foreman was down on the mid deck with Bobby Satcher. And as soon as we got main engine cutoff, Mike had to get out of his seat, go over to the locker um, that was over at the bottom of the stairs coming up from the mid deck to the, to the flight deck. And he had to pull out uh, a long lens camera and a video camera so that he could float up and Leland, I could give the camera to Leland because the two of them, their immediate job was to take pictures and video the external tank because we were concerned about, you know, any of the foam coming off during the ascent, like what caused the Columbia accident. Right. And so every time in training for, you know, a year plus, you know, once we got the main engine cut off, my job was to go ahead and lean down and reach down and grab the camera that Mike Foreman was handing me from the mid deck. We get the main engine cutoff on SCS 129. I look down, I see Mike, and he just takes the camera and just goes poof. And it just floats up through the hole up to the flight deck. And I'm like, going, wow, I'm really in space. <laughs> Able to, you know, bump it and it tends over to Leland and they do their thing. Um, and then it was the moment where I could then look out the front window. And my whole life, the horizon had been like this. And I look out the front window and all of a sudden the horizon's like this. That's crazy. And you know, right now your mind is like taking my curve of my hand, extrapolating the rest of the curve, you know, and, and making it the, the circle. And that's what my mind did. It's like, well, that's it. Then all there is, is, is this part that I'm not seeing yet. And that's it. That's the whole planet, you know? And then 90 minutes, you've gone around the whole earth, you know, the whole sphere, everything that human history and everybody you've ever known and every experience you've ever had has been on that little thing you just went on 90 minutes. It's pretty darn humbling and amazing that, you know, you could be going 17,500 miles an hour and, and make one rev of the entire planet in 90 minutes. That is nuts. And, Not and sure if that answered the question, but hopefully, hopefully it did. That for sure. Yeah, that was a great answer. <laughs> I was thinking too, I was like, you know, once you get up there, if you had any sort of like feelings about flat earth, potentially, it's just all out the window because now you're seeing it right there <laughs> out of your window. You got to think about it. If something is flat earth, if, if that was the case, then we'd be going along this way at 17,500 and then have to hawk this big turn to get around the other side pretty quick. <laughs> and I think I would have felt that, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's that's crazy. And and two, like you having that experience of, um, you know, your your wife's only a few miles away and, and you're trying to see if if we're going to take off this time. And then if this happens, that like all of that running through your mind and, and you're doing like something that not many humans get to do or experience all like in that same day, I, th I think it's just incredible. It's like you really you packed a lot into that, like one week, I feel like. <laughs> Well, you know, we say that uh, God, gave our, God gave, never gives us more than we can handle. Um, but, he, you know, he gave us peace that, you know, that was my job and th that was the timing of it. And so if she, you know, um, knew that once the solids you know, launched that uh, she was going back to Houston, she got back to Houston and went, you know, uh, into uh, the hospital the next day. And so here we are on day three, rendezvousing with the space station. The next day we were you know, going out the door for the sp first spacewalk and I was inside choreographing it. Um, talking to Bobby Satcher and Mike Foreman, who were outside. And then the plan was for the induce so that she delivered our daughter on the next day, which was a day off before I went out for the door for my first spacewalk. Well, wow. they induced her and um, the, our daughter was not born. She, my wife was still in labor. And so I go to bed that night before my first spacewalk, you know, the culmination of my entire aviation career, going out the door for, you know, a spacewalk in your own personal spacecraft. And my wife's in labor. But you kind of have to 
go to sleep and get ready for the next day because I'm going to do the most dangerous thing I've ever done. And get up in the morning expecting that my daughter had been bored and I can go out and do my job. My wife's still in labor. And so, okay, well, good Marine Corps, NASA training, compartmentalized. It was once we started into the prep to getting in the suit, it was okay. I, no matter what happens on the ground, they're not going to tell me. It's I've got to focus completely on this on the spacewalk. And so Mike and I, Foreman and I go out on my first spacewalk. It goes well. We get all this stuff done, a bunch of get ahead things. And so come back in. I'm you know excited. We did a great job and expecting to hear this. I pop my helmet off. Hey, your father. I get <laughs> my daughter's not born yet. And so my wife's still in labor. And so I was like, man, I'm going to be in trouble when I get home, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, get out of the suit, eat dinner, you know, call down. She's still in labor. And so we had to go into sleep that night um, and uh, had gotten up in the middle of the night. when We had a satellite pass to go call and check and talking to my wife's sister. And she's like, she's still in labor. And so I just, you know, but they put the phone on the table next to the bed. And I could hear the sounds of the delivery room. And then the satellite pass uh, ended and went back to sleep. And uh, uh, the next morning, uh, you, you, I don't know if you know, the shuttle had wake-up songs. And so, you know, the family members mm. would pick the wake-up song for each of the crew members that rotated through there. So they had picked out, my wife had picked out a song for, you know, the day our daughter was born. And so... Um, the, the music comes up over the the, uh, the audio system from uh, Mission Control, and they're playing uh, Butterfly Kisses. And so that was uh, a sign that our daughter had been born. And it turns out that uh, she had been born about 20 minutes after the, the satellite pass ended, and I had uh, you know lost calm at the ground. And so that day was a day off as we got prepared for the next day's spacewalk. And so about four in the afternoon, um, they finally had the video conference set up with uh, my wife down in the hospital and our daughter. I just seen some pictures of my daughter for the first time that they had emailed up a, about an hour earlier. And so I'm getting to talk to her and, and hear my daughter's voice and a little crying and talk to my wife and see how she was. And I look over towards the uh, the node two from the from the gym where I was having this private you know conference, and my commander's doing this. As soon as I hung up, I float out to the node, go down to the airlock, close the hatch. Bobby, I said, Thatcher and I had to depress the uh, airlock to get down to 10.2 PSI so we could do the camp out overnight and get the nitrogen out of our bodies to get ready for the spacewalk the next day. And I'm EV1. I'm leading the spacewalk that day after having just, you know, seen and heard my daughter for the first time. And so um, it was a busy few days, but, um, you know, guy gave me focus. He gave you know, my wife peace, gave her strength and um, was able to come home, uh, uh, you know, day after Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, meet my daughter for the first time. That's incredible. And and you again, going through this this whole project that you're on in this mission in space while your wife is in labor and, and you know, you're expecting any moment to find out about the baby and then, you know, right back to work once that's over is is crazy and uh i i think at least they will always have that story to tell and and she will have that story to tell that my dad was in space when i was born and and i think that's definitely going to be like the coolest fun fact she's never going to have a problem at school telling her fun fact that's that's definitely going to be the best one so that's uh that's awesome well, you, you, you think about it, it's no different than, than our military members and, and other people you know that are they're stationed you know, away from home and, and the same thing happens and you know, a lot, especially for military, a lot of them are, you know, in harm's way and, and they have to, you know, just like I did, compartmentalize and focus on the stuff that's going to kill you, you know, and while, you know, important life events are still happening back at home. And so that's why, you know, support of our military who are deployed um, is, is, you know, supremely important for us as Americans. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I want to ask you real quick um, a little bit about the Artemis Project um, and the different missions that are involved there. Um, I know you're an integral part of what's happening there as, uh, as well as Crew 5, uh, who's, who's up there right now with our friend uh, Nicole. Um, but where do you see this project going and, and what does this project mean and these missions mean for uh, the future of humans in space? That's not an overly broad question at all, but I'll try <laughs> to put in digestible bites. Um, Trying to stump yeah, it. I mean, it's, yeah, the last time we went to the moon was, you know, December 1972 was the last time humans were there. And over the course of Apollo, which was astounding, you know, success in the time frame that it took to build it. And, you know, the fact that we put 12 humans on the, on the lunar surface during that time frame at a time where we didn't know it was possible. 
you know, we, when we, President Kennedy made his speech, we had 15 minutes of space flight under our belt. And yet by the end of the decade, we were supposed to put humans on the moon and we did it. That is just astounding. I mean, there, there were the geologists that thought that we may lose the crew when we land on the moon because we don't know if the LEM's going to go, you know, just sink into lunar regolith and just, just get swallowed up and disappear like quicksand. You know, we just had that much unknown. And that's why, you know, right now with Artemis, we are going to the moon on the way to Mars, but we know that we, you know, what the moon is about. We've had rovers on Mars. It's not this big unknown. It's just us having the, the will and the uh, the technical capability to be able to build the vehicles that are going to allow us to get there and, and do the science. Um, Artemis consists of the Orion spacecraft, which just came back from its first Artemis One mission, where it's the capsule that could carry four crew, be from Earth surface out to the the lunar space. Uh, and then return the crew back to Earth's surface. It's aboard the SLS rocket, the Space Launch System. You know, the world's largest rocket ever built, most powerful rocket, and it performed, you know, almost flawlessly um, on the Artemis One mission. It took us a little while to get there. We had some, you know, some testing that we had to do, and then we had some, you know, launch attempts where we were um, trying to get off the ground in, in uh, uh, back in. Uh, earlier in the fall, you know, and didn't work out, but we were learning because it's the first time we launched a big rocket like that since the shuttle program. And so we had some issues that we, the team went out and figured out, got smarter on, and then we were able to launch and get the mission uh, off uh, when we did. And the ground system folks, the folks that had to run launch, you know, the LCC, the launch control center, and have the, uh, um, the, the systems that supplied those, the rocket and Orion with the fuel and the electro, uh, the oxygen and all the, the capabilities that it needed to charge the batteries to be able to maintain the vehicles on the ground before they launch, you know, the launch towers and everything like that. And then the, the uh, Orion spacecraft takes the crew to what will be a space station around the moon uh, called Gateway. And that will allow the crew to be able to dock Orion to it and then meet up with a lunar lander, which is called the HLS, the Human Landing System. Right now, we've got the, the uh, first vehicle picked for the Human Landing System is from SpaceX. It's their Starship. And then they're actually doing a, a source selection right now for a second one that will allow us to have another vendor of another design to be able to go to the lunar surface. Um, you Kind of like we did with Commercial Crew, uh, over the past decade where we had the Boeing Starliner and the SpaceX Dragon that can either one can take vehicles to the space station. We'll have the uh, SpaceX Starship as well as a second vendor selected hopefully within the next year that allow us to have multiple vehicles and go to the lunar surface. What that does is allow us to go to the lunar surface and spend, you know, a week and then two weeks and then four weeks and then finally have a sustained presence there in a habitat with rovers that are similar to what we had initially um, on the Apollo missions, we call it LTV. So it's crew in their space suits out on a you know dune buggy type of uh, vehicle. They'll be able to do you know scientific work as well as transport the crew, as well as when the crew's not there, be able to go autonomously go down and do, do lunar work. Also a pressurized rover built by one of our international partners. They allow the crew to be shirt sleeve environment, driving around in a rover and then get it in their spacesuits and then go out on a spacewalk to go ahead and collect the science and the things that they are, that they're seeing out there as they explore wow. the lunar surface. And so all of this equipment together is, is, is Artemis. And that's, you know, the, the lunar surface is just pulverized rock. There's no atmosphere, there's no wind, there's no erosion, there's no water. And so everything is just smashed rock. And so everything, you know, we found out from Apollo, that stuff is jagged. It is, you know, tears up suits and gears and, and everything gets in everywhere. And so if we can live and work on the moon for a sustained period and the hatch seals that we have for airlocks and that the joints that we have for our spacesuits and the gloves that we have to do the, the lunar work, you know, if we can make the systems robust enough to survive on the moon, guess what? When we go to Mars, the journey is longer but the environment is actually not as bad. It has even more of an atmosphere, actually it has an atmosphere compared to the moon, but therefore that means we have windstorms and dust storms. We've seen all that from our rovers. So that means all the particles and the things there are getting tumbled. They're getting, they're not as jagged as the moon. You know, we've seen evidence of where we thought there was water on Mars, where rocks have been tumbled in the stream beds. And so our equipment going to Mars should have a easier time. So therefore the risk of that equipment failing and are the gears of our wheels or anything like that failing in Mars is much lower because we've been able to wow. test it out and show it's robust on the moon. So now it's just getting between Earth and Mars where it's a you know eight, nine month journey with current, current chemical rockets 
surviving that radiation environment, being able to have the fuel we need, have the food we need, uh, the air we need to breathe on Mars, that'll be the harder part. Not whether or not we get there and things start breaking because they're not uh, not going to last. For sure. So that's why Artemis is, is the launching pad for uh, you know the rest of the solar system. Yeah, that's incredible, and and I had no idea about that stuff, and it's it's really cool to see where like our exploration so far is is pointing towards the future, and and uh, it's it's pretty great. Um, I want to offer here just kind of a last minute thing, you know, if you ever need anyone, like if somebody drops out, I got this this week and it's not like the comfiest, but if you did need like somebody extra to come with you, I'm like, I'm more than happy to join you on that trip. I think you and I have good, you know, back and forth and, and I'd love to be on that trip with you if you need, only if you need, you know. All right. Well, you know, crew resource management is something we practice a lot, just like, you know, anywhere else in aviation and things like that. And so, yeah, good rapport is definitely necessary, good technical understanding. You know, the neat part is, is look at what's happening in commercial space right now. Oh, yeah. You know, not not just with what the government's doing, you take the International Space Station, but look at all these other companies doing sub, multiple companies doing suborbital, multiple companies doing orbital, and multiple companies building, looking to build their own, you know, orbital space stations. You know, the ISS is looking to near the end of its lifetime, you know, around 2030. But we've got Axiom Space, we've got Sierra Space, we've got other companies that are looking to, you know, expand that. And there is more opportunity for people to go to space, you know, every single day going forward. And so, you know, we've had 560 something humans go to space to this point in history. I mean, imagine the day when there's 560 going to space every day. You know, that Pretty will, crazy. you know, make us a, a space faring, you know, uh, you know, uh, species. And, you know, for every astronaut that's been able to go to space and see, you know, this of their Earth, um, it's been, you know, something that touches the soul. You, you, you feel part of a planet. You, you feel differently about what goes on down there because you, you don't see any of the hardships or the or the borders or any of the fighting. You, you just see this peaceful little blue marble that has this really tiny atmosphere <laughs> that is the difference between life and death. And, uh, you know, the more people that can see that, the maybe the more, you know, the better we are towards each other down here on the ground. For sure. Uh, I think that's great. And I think that's a... Uh a nice final word to uh, to leave off on. But hey, again, really appreciated you taking the time to uh, to speak with me and to come on the show. I know uh, everybody's going to love to hear about uh, your different missions and, and kind of how you got to where you were. Um, and again, uh, from me and the listeners, really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my pleasure, Ben. And I mean, it just goes to show that, uh, you know, the only person that can uh, tell you no is yourself. And if, if I had at any point you know, uh, told myself that I couldn't do something, then um, I wouldn't have a chance to you know, follow a dream and, and be where I'm at right now. And so for all the young people out there, don't let somebody tell you no. You know, if, if you come into an, encounter an obstacle, go around it, figure out another way and, you know, live your life doing something that you're passionate about because that's what gives you, gives you purpose. I love that. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. Where uh, where should people follow you and your future work with Artemis, um, social media or website? What's the best place to go? Um, certainly, you know, the, the NASA website is a great uh, source for everything going on, not just me, but, you know, the current crews that are up on the space station, the ones that are you know, training for flight, you know, everything for Artemis. Um, for, for me personally, you know, there's a Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's at Astro Comrade, K-O-M-R-A-D-E. Um, you can go back and look at my entire uh, training and spaceflight mission um, from my last space flight. There's been stuff since then, you know, it's somewhat quieter, you know, that I'm not training right now. Um, we got some Artemis stuff up there, um, but it's, uh, you know, any of the astronauts in the office that, you know, the ones that are in space right now, you know, uh, it's at Astro and then uh, typically their last name or their call sign. And so, you know, go take a look, see what's happening with your taxpayer dollars, you know, and seeing how <laughs> we're you know, putting humans further out into space. I love that. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to talking with you in the future. All right. Sounds great, Ben. Thanks. Thank you.